Good morning, and welcome to Worship at First Church. We're so glad that you joined us today. And those of you that are watching us via uh, YouTube at home, we welcome you as well. I have a few announcements for you today. Next Sunday is our Back to Church Sunday, June 21st. There's an update about protocols and how we are going to orchestrate worship on phase one, and that you can find at our website. You need to sign up for either the 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. worship service. So if you haven't done that, please get a, a message into Pastor Steve or myself because we need to plan a seating chart. The Monday Night Bible Study has begun, and it's on the Book of Esther. And that is going to continue via Zoom. So if you need an invitation for uh, the Bible study, please uh, send a message to Pastor Steve, and he'll email you an invitation to join. The family ministry is up and going, and they are planning some great summer events that are going to be held outside. There's going to be hikes and scavenger hunts. You're going to want to be involved. And so the first one begins this coming Wednesday, June 17th. You're going to meet here at the church at 4 o'clock, and then we're going to be told where we're going to be going. If you want more information about this program, contact Gloria Jean or uh, Jess Brown. For the Crossroads Youth Group, Come join those hikes. I'm going to be on them, and so I'd love to see your face out there. I'm also going to put up this week another video on the book Grow Down, so be sure to watch that. Also, you might have received, or it soon will be coming to your door, the last survival kit um, for you. In it is a book on how to start your day with prayer. So I hope you've been enjoying both Grow Down and getting these survival kits. One way that we can survive in this is by being in constant communication with God. So what about today's service? It's going to be a little different. It's a recording, and that's okay. It's going to be what you're going to experience or see for the next month or so as we get in the equipment in order to live stream. So we, Pastor Steve and I thought it'd be a great idea to show you what worship's going to be like at First Church. As you sit there at home, if you've chosen to do that, this will be how worship will be. So without ado, we are going to begin this morning with our worship. So let us come with a spirit of contemplation as we hear the inquiry.
Will you join me in this morning's call to worship? The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. We love you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. You'll join me in the first hymn this morning, which is number 590. I'll live for him. <laughs> Gracious and loving God, we come together united in your spirit. And although we are physically apart, we join in worship of you this day. And as we worship from our homes, there are many distractions that can come our way. Help us to remain focused on your word and on your presence in our lives. In this time together, we seek to be drawn nearer to you. To have our hearts transformed and our minds renewed. We come from the darkness of the world to be into your light. Our spirits are tired and worn as we battle daily with the forces of evil and wickedness that would seek to destroy our very lives. Protect us as we pray, refresh and restore our spirits through your life-giving work. Lord, we want our entire lives to be centered and focused on you and your will for our lives. Give us the strength to endure each day of the week. May our lives be a living sacrifice to you. Lead us to not surrender to the pressures upon us to tempt us to lead us astray. Guide us away from the false and empty promises of the world and to put our trust in you. In worship, we are reminded that your Son, our Lord and Savior, deserves our full allegiance. 
He is our all in all. He gave his life for each of us and has freed us from death, forgiven us from our sins. And in obedience, we come to you in his name. We come with open hearts, with open minds, with open ears and eyes. Speak deeply to our souls and lift us beyond the shadows of this world so that we may see more clearly your deep and abiding love for us. Your Son, Jesus, taught us how to love, how to live, and how to pray. And although we may struggle at times in following his commands, we know that you are listening to us. We ask that you hear us now as we join in the prayer he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I know you've been keeping up on TV, and uh, I know the kids are excited, so I ask that Pastor Jonathan that we now stand up and uh, come forward with our children's message. Well, good morning, kids. It's uh, good to see you via television. And there's one thing I need to ask. Have you ever promised anything? Hmm. I know I have. And did you follow through on that promise? Say you promised to share your lunch with somebody. Did you follow through? Well, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah has to say this. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. What Isaiah was trying to tell us is that God gave a promise and he'll fulfill that promise. And, and I have with me today, I, I brought something, I bet you you'll recognize it if you played with it in the nursery uh, as a kid. It, it's Noah's Ark. Because God makes a promise to Noah and his family. Let's see what the story says. We all know that Noah was called to build this ark and to bring the animals in so that uh, they could be saved because of a huge flood that was going to come. But after that flood, this is where the promise comes. So then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him saying, now behold, I myself will establish my covenant. Covenant is kind of like the same word as promise. With you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you and all of that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. So God makes a promise saying, I will not destroy the earth again by flood. The entire earth. We know that floods happen now, but God's talking about the entire earth. And so what does he do to for us to remember and for him when... Uh, he remembers the covenant that he gives. He puts a rainbow in the sky. And he says, I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring the cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of so God is faithful. His word, what he has said in the Bible, is faithful and true. It means that his promises to us will be fulfilled. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can stand on your promise that you gave us long ago. That when we see a rainbow in the sky, 
that it reminds us that you are faithful. And we thank you, Father, for giving us a covenant, for promising that you will never destroy the earth again, and you have sent us your Son to love us so. And we thank you for your promises. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. See you next time, kids. Thank you, Pastor John. It's good to remember the faithfulness of God and how we can be an example of that in our lives. We are faithful as we pray for one another, as we lift one another up and share with one another our joys and concerns. And so let us now come together in prayer, lifting them up before our Lord. Let us pray. With open hearts, we come to you today, O Lord. Some coming with pain, some with worry, some facing temptation, and others with fear. Some with joy, some who have experienced healing. We have been given the strength and wisdom that comes from you, that helps us to overcome the trials that we face. And today we come to you, our loving and gracious God, for you promise that you hear and answer each of our prayers. Help us to listen as well as to act. Help us respond to the trials and temptations we encounter rather than just to react to them. Provide us with the moment we need so that in haste we do not hurt others. Give us wisdom as we respond to do so in a way that would bring glory and honor to your holy name. And now, Lord, we bring our petitions before you, asking for healing for those who are suffering physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We pray for provision for those who are struggling financially and finding it difficult to make ends meet. Use us. Make us your hands and heart to reach out. We pray for those traveling, that you would put a hedge of protection about them. Watch over them on their journey and their return home safely. We lift up those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask that you surround them with your peace and bring them comfort. We pray for all those who are upcoming medical treatments and procedures or surgeries. May they rest in your presence, knowing you are there with them. Lord, we lift up our national and local government leaders. Speak to their hearts and give them wisdom that they make, that they need to make God-honoring decisions. We pray for our church as we return to worshiping together. Lead us to be safe and cautious. Protect us, we pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the assurance that you have heard our prayers. And we leave them at your feet, having cast them to you. And we trust in you as we wait and as we listen. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, this morning, I have asked uh, Pastor Jonathan to bring forward our tithes and offerings a box that will be out in the narthex when you return next week on the 21st. And uh, today what we want to do is dedicate all the gifts that have been received since uh, we went into the shutdown. I think our last service was actually March 15th, or right around there. And so from that on, we have been receiving tithes and offerings through the mail, online. And uh, we just want to give thanks to God for those who have done it and uh, ask him to consecrate these gifts. So would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? Gracious and almighty God, we thank you that you have called us to be your church. And to be your church, Lord, it takes finances. It takes people willing to give of their incomes, of what they have, to support the missions and ministry of this church. Lord, I pray your blessing upon all those who have been supporting it through their tithes, their gifts, and offerings. 
by dropping it off in, in the uh, mail slot, by mailing it, by going online and donating the many ways that they have given. Ask your special blessing to be upon them and their families and this church. And may we continue to move forward, uh, strengthened by your spirit and uh, with the uh, funds that have been provided to continue the ministry. So we ask, Lord, that you would consecrate these gifts for their holy use in the furtherance of your kingdom and the building of the ministries here at this church. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. I'd like to uh, have to read uh, two scriptures this morning. The first scripture is from the Old Testament and it is Psalm 84. Again, Psalm 84. I'll be reading the entire Psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage, as they pass through the valley of Baca, and make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Selah. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk his blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Where there is no Greek, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, for Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word.
Heavenly Father, hear our prayer. Keep us in thy loving care. Guide us through the live long day in our work and in our play. Keep us pure and sweet and true in everything we say and do. Amen. I can remember my mom or my mom and dad or dad, one of them, would sit at the edge of our beds and we would recite that nightly prayer. It was a it was a time when we would come together and think about how we could be better tomorrow. It was kind of our pledge to seek to be a different, a bit different the next day, trying to listen to God and to, to follow Him. And we liked it a lot better than that prayer that said, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I should die before I wake. We weren't too thrilled with that one. We liked it. Ours better. A pledge to do what God wants us to do. A few weeks ago, we wrapped up our series and our Bible study on the Apostles' Creed. And as I was thinking about this idea of a pledge, idea of allegiance, the concept of devoting oneself to something, I, I came back and thought about this creed and I reread it. And I thought when we recite this creed, we are making a pledge. We are giving our allegiance to Almighty God. We are reminded as we recite that creed that this is what we believe. This is who we put our trust in, and, and we are pledging to follow Him. I'm not sure if you're aware, but today is Flag Day. This is the day we remember as the time and the day that the American flag was officially adopted as the banner under which we would fight for our freedom from England. Up to this point, the states fought under different banners, different designs. And then in 1777, the Congress adopted the flag with the 13 stripes of red and white and the 13 stars in that field of blue. And this would be the new banner under which all states would fight. And today we honor that flag as we stand and we pledge allegiance to that for which it stands. When we as a church stand and recite the Apostles' Creed, we are doing so in unity. In unity to honor and declare that we believe what is stated it is something of a Christian's pledge of allegiance. I don't know about you, if you think back, I can imagine those members in Congress, after adopting that flag as the national flag, standing for the first time to honor it, to think of the pride they felt, the joy that rose up within them, and the hope that they believed in and felt for a new future. And also a deep reverence for which the flag stood. I don't think it was much different than what the early church probably felt when they first stood and recited the Apostles' Creed together. There was this unwavering devotion within their hearts as they spoke the words of the Creed that united them with one another and united them with Almighty God. It was and is the banner under which this church and the church is to rally and be willing to fight for. As we look at that creed and as we stand and recite it, it's making two statements. One statement when the early church, church stood was their rejection of the rulers of this world. And the second was their devotion and allegiance to Almighty God. And as we think back to the early church, and to think about the courage it took, the strength it took for them to make the stand, we should be in awe of the courage that they showed. For they were under the threat of death. As they met in their homes or out in the field, wherever they were, there was always a threat of who would come through that door, who would cause death them pain and persecution. Yet they were willing to stand and give their lives if necessary for their beliefs and allegiance to God. 
We saw that they took their stance in Rome and rejected the idea that Caesar was their God. They would not go along with the mantra of the culture. And with boldness and unwavering trust in their God, they recited their creed and their allegiance to him. We take a step back and look at our, our culture today and, and what it is like. We're not going to find much difference than it was those 2,000 years ago. Sure, the themes have changed. But we still are under constant pressure to give in to the culture's priorities, to succumb to what society wants. Today, when we pledge our allegiance to God, we are telling the culture that we reject those priorities and we live only for Jesus Christ. We stand up and say that the things of this world will not be our God. They will not control our lives, and we will not bow to them. We know that only God can satisfy the longing that is within our souls, that longing for peace, that longing for hope. And there is nothing in this world that is able to do that. Only Christ can. Now, sure, I know we can get some pleasure from the material things of the world, but that pleasure is fleeting and temporary. We may feel secure with some of the things of this world, but when difficulties arise, that security fades away. There is a cry coming out of society, out of the secular world today, and that cry is, be self-satisfied. Get what you want when you want it. You deserve it. As a matter of fact, you are entitled to it. And we are being led down that path, a path that leads to destruction. No matter what we have, it seems like we always want more. We are never satisfied. The desire for more and more stuff, the desire for more and more sexual encounters, more and more partners of a great sexual freedom has left people empty and broken. More money, bigger homes, luxurious cars, the crippled families with massive debt, and the pressure they live under is breaking apart homes, families, and marriages. Too many have given allegiance to the things of this world, and we as a church must stand up, pledge our allegiance to God to seek to stop this trend to stop the path of destruction. But beyond, beyond the physical and the material false hopes that, is, that are being pushed upon us, there is this idea that you can worship whoever you want, that there are so many and many multiple ways to salvation, and each of us can have our own way. Whatever feels right to you, do it. Whatever makes you feel good can't be bad, so believe in it, follow it. Worship what you want, who you want. Believe in whatever higher power you want to, and you will find peace. I don't know about you, but you look around the world, and I don't see much peace as people follow whatever God they want. And what saddens me is there are many Christian churches who are accepting this false narrative being fed them by the secular world. And they are doing it in hope of appearing more compassionate and more welcoming. And meanwhile, many of the lost, many of those struggling are losing hope. They are not finding the peace they so desperately. Many are being led astray and are being led away from Jesus. And we, who are Bible-based, who are Christ-centered, need to bring the truth to the world and to save the lost. When we join in the ancient creeds of the church, 
we are rejecting that narrative of the society that said more and more and more or do whatever you want. And instead, we are standing on the promises of the word of God. We stand and proclaim that we believe God has come to the world to save sinners and that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. We believe and trust that he has made known to us that path to everlasting life through his son, his one and only son, our Savior Jesus. As we have learned from the creed, Jesus died, and Jesus rose from the dead, and that he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. We have a God who is alive today, and we can trust in him. We also have our word, God's word, where in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I consider myself a patriot. I, I've had, you know, I didn't serve in the service, but my dad was in the army. I had a brother in the army, two brothers in the Marines who sacrificed their time and balance in serving this nation. And even with all its faults, we have a wonderful country. And I believe patriotism to be very important to the life of this country. But it, too, is under assault from society. It has somewhat, somehow been turned into a bad thing. Now, we should stand for our flag. We should stand up for our nation. But we must remember that any of that is subject to the allegiance to Almighty God. When we give our lives to Jesus, we are united in Him. He becomes our King for an eternity. With Jesus, we walk in the light, and without Him, we are walking in darkness. You see, yes, we are members or part of America, but as it says in Philippians 3.20, we are or our citizenship is in heaven. Think about that for a moment. No matter where you live on this earth, no, what, no matter what family or group or nationality or ethnicity, whatever you belong to here on earth, you're only on a journey. And there is a true home that awaits all those that become united in and our identity is with God. Our identity is with the king of all things. Not with any country or nationality or political party. America is a great place to live. But only for a while. For heaven awaits us. Yes, we have great freedoms that we celebrate and opportunities beyond measure. Yet this is not our primary identity. We should proudly and without pause declare ourselves as citizens of the kingdom of God. All other allegiances come after and are subject to our allegiance to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is our absolute Lord. And as citizens of the nation, we are to submit to its laws. We are to follow the laws that have been established. And where we work, we have to follow the rules. In families, there is a hierarchy where children are to submit to the authority of the parents. And within the church, there is a hierarchy that we, as church members, we are to submit to the spiritual leadership of the elders and the pastors of the church. But all of this is subject to our allegiance to Almighty God. Not one of these authorities goes above them. 
every commitment we make is subject to the premise that they must align with the teaching of Scripture. All our allegiances, all our commitments to anything, whether it's family, work, church, nationality, political party, are secondary to the will of God. Whatever we do or say should reflect our allegiance to Him first and foremost. Yes, patriotism in America has led to great freedoms for the people of this nation. And we should and must take the opportunity to honor those who have sacrificed for those blessings and freedoms that we have today. But when we give thanks for these three freedoms and these blessings, we must remember and be certain that we put our focus on the one who has bestowed the blessings upon us, and that is our God. In thanksgiving, we bow before him, our maker, for he alone has shown us his great mercy, and he has given us the blessings that we really do not deserve. For each one of us has fallen short. None of us have earned any of those blessings we have been given. And we are all in need of forgiveness. That is why it is so important to make Jesus our number one priority in life. For only in him do we find the forgiveness we so desperately need. And in him we find the healing for our hearts and the strength to overcome the temptations of the world. To block out that mantra of more and more and do what you want. But rather to do what God wants. As Christians we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And being our Savior... It is a wonderful thing. He is the one through his death and resurrection that has freed us from sin and death. And we join in Holy Communion each month to remember the sacrifice made for us. And each day we should praise God for his wonderful gift of grace given to us through his Son. But we also must celebrate Christ as Lord. And for him to be Lord of your life takes more than remembrance. It takes obedience. It takes submission. It takes determination. It takes allegiance. So I pray you will join with me together as his church to make each day and give our allegiance to Jesus, to make each day his day, a day that we honor, a day that we glorify him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give our allegiance to you. Empower us to overcome the temptations of the world, those desires to give in to wanting more and more, but instead to recognize you as our King and our Lord and to pledge ourselves to you. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And now in our closing hymn, it is number 605, Living for Jesus. Thank you.
I was challenged today for my heart and where is, does its allegiance stand? The Word of God says we have a choice. We can choose to go off to serve other gods, or we can, we can serve the Lord who rescues, who helps us, who fights for us. The Word of God says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's a question that you can go with today as we leave. Where does our allegiance stand? So let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word and that it causes us to, to question, to shore up, to firm up our beliefs in you. You call us not to be dismayed not to fear, not be worried, because you, our God, our Savior, goes with us wherever we are, and we stand on that promise today that we find in your word, and it's through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray today, amen. So I'm glad you joined us today. Let us go in peace and see you next week. Amen.